I'll fight your battle. Somebody knows what it's like to trust in God, to trust in the God who was before there was a was, to trust in the God who put the stars in the sky, the planets in their rotation, and allowed us to be alive even right now, to trust in God. Brothers and sisters, I believe there is, in fact, a word from the Lord today. We're going to look together in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, beginning at the 23rd verse. I thank God for all that has gone forth already here at Pilgrim Church from our Bible enrichment to praise and worship to the worship experience here, the prayers that have already been prayed, the songs that have already been sung. Uh, God is indeed a great God and greatly to be praised. We're going to look together now at Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 23, down through, I think, verse 31. And there it reads, When they were released... They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together and said, Sovereign Lord, 
who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them who through the mouth of our father David your servant said by the Holy Spirit why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place and now Lord look upon their threats and grant that your servants continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus and when they had prayed the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness amen brothers and sisters as we prepare to focus our sermonic spotlight on these few verses I'd like to hang a tag on this text good trouble good trouble let us pray Holy and always, God, we thank you for your word. It is indeed a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet, God. I ask, God, that you use me now even in spite of me. I thank you afresh for the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation through Christ with you. And I ask, God, now that you use me now even in spite of me, that your word might go forth with clarity and with purpose, that your people might be edified, but more than anything, God, that your name might be glorified. It has already been glorified glorified again in Jesus name amen amen you may be seated amen amen I'm pausing because I'm trying to do some things a little bit different um, uh, and the objective is to hopefully make the sermon a little more brief and a little more pointed uh, so, uh, I'm going to try to stick to a script, and, uh, I'm, but I'm not going to try so hard that I uh, miss, miss the celebration, all right? All right. Um, good trouble. Some of you may know that that term is associated with Congressman John Lewis, born in 1940, died in 2020. Some of you know he's a revered American civil rights leader and U.S. congressman, a key figure in the struggle for racial equality. He dedicated his life to nonviolent activism, following in the legacy of Martin Luther King. His legacy includes playing a pivotal role, some of you know, in the March on Washington and the Selma to Montgomery marches. Throughout his life, he promoted justice and equality. The phrase good trouble became synonymous with Congressman John Lewis and his philosophy of nonviolent activism. John Lewis recognized that he had a synonymous way of connecting good trouble with necessary trouble. The concept uh, is associated with his efforts and the way that he helped and trained others to lean in to push for positive change to encourage more peace and and and, and even though his methods were peaceful they were still disruptive his methods were peaceful but they were still disruptive and let me say uh, that it's as you study the uh, civil rights movement uh, that Martin King and, and, and so many others uh, were tied to, uh, you can see that nonviolent uh, protest was an intentional thing that, that took training, it took preparation, 
It took more training and more preparation. Uh, the, the, the folks who sat, uh, they, they were fighting against their own human instincts for a greater good. Throughout John Lewis's life, he engaged in this nonviolent protest. And some of you may know that uh, he even suffered uh, beating to the point where he, he had a stammering tongue for the rest of his life. He, he, he suffered so badly. And I wonder if you today realize that your life is filled with opportunities for good trouble. Your life is filled with opportunities for necessary trouble. Uh, throughout your efforts and your, your presence in social media or, or, or presence here at church, your presence in the community, your presence in your family, there are opportunities for you to push in peaceful ways, yet disruptive ways, to push for positive change. Peaceful, disruptive, pushing for positive change. That, my brothers and sisters, is where we find Peter and John. They, they had done a peaceful presentation of Jesus to the people in Jerusalem. They, they had done some incredible and mighty works. But these white works were inherently disruptive to the religious order of their day. Lest, lest I get too far off, I know that you all are already Bible scholars, but, but um, let's catch up. Let's catch up. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, it depicts the post-resurrection interactions of Jesus and his disciples. Uh, he instructs them to await the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. After ascending to heaven, the disciples select uh, Matthias to replace Judas. Those of you who are Bible scholars, you know that he uh, uh, replaced Judas and became uh, that disciple so that they would have the 12 disciples in place, uh, the 12 apostles, excuse me. Acts chapter 2, that's where we find the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends on the people, empowering them to speak in various languages. I want to part parenthetically here. The Pentecost is a miracle of hearing. It's a miracle where they spoke in Aramaic, but people heard in their own language, in Greek, Latin, uh, um, uh, Egyptian, uh, all the languages that were there. They heard it in their own language. It's the opposite of the Tower of Babel. Here God is a lot is overcoming human languages so that people can hear the gospel. Thousands of people got saved. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John encounter the lame beggar. Some of you know the story. Peter and John went to the temple gate called Beautiful. They meet a brother who'd been lame. He's 40 years old. Oh, you, you guys are falling asleep. You make me want to preach the story, and I haven't even gotten to the sermon yet. You know the story. Remember, they, they walk up to him, and he asks them for some money, and they say, we don't have any silver, but such as I have give to you. Come on, y'all know the story. Y'all looking at me. What did he give? In the name. Rise up and walk. That's peaceful, but it's disruptive. Here he is, uh, a lame brother, lame from birth. Rise up and walk. It was such a mighty act of God, so disruptive that the people were astonished. And you know what Peter did? He preached another sermon. Thousands more people come on in the church. And then we get to Acts chapter 4. How do the religious leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the chief priests and the elders respond to this miraculous healing in the name of Jesus Christ? The a healing that cannot be denied, but it's disruptive to the religious order and customs of the day. How do they respond? They bring him in for a talk. And they start to talk to him and they say, look, you all need to stop talking in the name of this Jesus character. You're making us look bad and you're trying to put his death on us. So 
they, they, they began to, to, to try to quiet them down, to stop them from talking about who? About Jesus. And what's their response? Those of you who are Bible scholars, you know what the response was. They say, you judge for yourself whether it's right for us to stop talking about Jesus. But we cannot stop talking about what we have seen and heard. And then they go on and they start to talk about, and you, you were not the only ones who saw it and heard it. It was all over Jerusalem how he healed the sick and how he opened blinded eyes, how he unstopped deaf ears. He even brought old Lazarus from the grave after being dead for four long days. You know all about Jesus. And not only that, but they began to tell them the story. You know how you all rejected him. The chief cornerstone he described, Peter describes him as, was rejected. But yet, he's now become the head, the chief he was rejected, but he's now become the chief cornerstone. And that, that's another sermon all by itself. And so here we find Peter and John have been out doing what it is that God has called them to do, preaching and teaching and talking about Jesus. Now, there's something that, that kind of blows my mind. Uh, if you look earlier in Acts chapter 3 and 4, they start to talk about all the things that Jesus did, and they start to talk about how he opened blinded eyes, how he healed the sick. And, and then they said, there's another phrase that says, and it's right at the same level of these tangible miracles. It says that, they, that in the name of Jesus, they were able to speak good news to the poor. Now, good news to the poor is at the same level as physical and tangible healing. So what is this good news to the poor? Well, I'm glad you asked. We, we don't have enough time to really get into it now. I encourage you to join us in Bible study where we can begin to unpack some of these theological concepts. But let me say it this way. Uh, there are fundamentally, from the biblical perspective, two kingdoms on the planet. There are two kingdoms on the planet. One kingdom is run by the enemy. The other kingdom is the kingdom of God. And the way that we understand our salvation, it means that we have been plucked from one ledger and we've been placed by God's grace through the work, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ onto another ledger. We have a new type of life. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The, the, John says it this way, that we've been adopted, we've been made children of God, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. The Bible says that God will have mercy on whom God will have mercy. So if you are a blood-bought, born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have been snatched from the kingdom of this world, and you have been placed into your citizenship, has now been placed into the kingdom of God by God's grace and by God's will and by God's power, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so they were so excited. Paul says that, that in this Christian community, they, they were so, that, that good news to the poor was so powerful that it changed their social structure. It changed the way they operated. Paul says it like this in Galatians chapter 3, that the sons of God are neither male nor female. They're neither Jew nor Gentile. They're neither slave nor free. They are sitting around a table, eating the bread and drinking the wine, and all the stuff that we get messed up about, gender, neither slave nor female, male nor female. Socioeconomic stuff, neither, uh, uh, sorry, male, neither male nor female, neither slave nor free, uh, and neither Jew nor Gentile. That's all the sectarian stuff that we get caught up around. And so... So there's a radically flat community, a radically egalitarian community that they are now establishing in Jerusalem. It's disruptive. Come on. And, so, and so last week we talked about 
courage. And, and some of you may remember we are, uh, we are lifting up some, some cardinal values for leadership. This is six months of leadership development. January is courage. February, we're going to go to humble. Uh, then we're going to switch to, uh, uh, oh, I, I can't spell it now. Uh, we're going to go to R. We're going to go to responsible. Uh, then inspired by the Holy Ghost. And then in June, we're going to hit true. Uh, leaders are true, true to God, true to the kingdom, true to their calling, true to their family. They're true. And so, so that spells Christ for those of you who are following the acronym. And so we are in six months of leadership development. And January, we've been preaching and teaching and singing Thank You Music Ministry with this value of courage. We're trying to dig into courage. And I think it's good that we're starting with courage because you cannot practice all of these values and virtues unless you have courage. So last week, we looked at King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was locked up in Jerusalem with the armies of the king uh, uh, Sennacherib of, of Assyria outside the gate, making fun of them, insulting them. And we talked about Deacon Lasser had them this morning in Bible enrichment. The courage to worship, the courage to work, the courage to wait. And so now today we're going to be talking about courage again. We're back in the city of Jerusalem, but this time the enemy is not outside the gate. The enemy is not encamped around the city, outside the walls of the gate. This time, the enemies are all in the city, behind the walls with the disciples. So the disciples have to have a special kind of courage because there is no wall, there is no gate to protect them from the plans of these enemies. So I want somebody to recognize that it's okay to be getting into good trouble for the cause of Christ as we take courage. Well, there's so much that I wish we could talk about here, but, but I don't, I don't want to take too much more of our time uh, without getting into a, a brief survey of Peter. Some of you all know Peter, and, and some of you know John. So very quickly, Peter's a pivotal f uh, figure. You all know him in the New Testament. Uh, he emerges uh, as one of Jesus Christ's closest disciples. Some of you know that he uh, vacillated between some unwavering loyalty and human frailty. Uh, you know that he had impulsive tendencies. Uh, you know that he, he was uh, bold and proclaimed Jesus, but then he denied Jesus three times. Some, you all know about Peter? We can move on to John. All right, Peter. Peter, the main thing I want you to remember, he was a, a combination of great loyalty, but also human frailty. Is that, is that your story? Somebody here knows what it's like to be impulsive, to miss the mark, to be excited and, and, and faithful one minute and missing the mark and fussing the next minute. Somebody knows what it's like to, 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 to start off in the morning high and lift it up, but by lunchtime at noon, <laughs> we done changed our mind. All right, all right, y'all got that one. Well, let's, let's go on to John. John's the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple, he, you know, he's laying on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. Uh, uh, he's, um, he's, he's in close with both Peter, John, uh, and John's brother, James. They, they, they were at the transfiguration. They, John, John was, was at the actual crucifixion. Some of you know he took care. He was given charge of Jesus' mama to take care of Jesus' mama. You know he was close to Jesus. He was close to Jesus, and he was a scholar. Some of you know uh, uh, we recognize him as the author of John's gospel and the epistles that attributed to John. So John, John also lived a long time. So here we have two characters. Uh, one character is impulsive and all over the place. Another one is you know, more um, intimately uh, connected with, with what it is that Jesus is doing. If you read John's gospel, You'll see it has a different flavor from, the, uh, from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It has a different flavor in that it's, it's emphasizing the power and divinity of Jesus. Uh, and so, so, so but, but both of them in Acts chapter 4, 13 are described as uneducated and common. They do this miracle. They heal this brother. He's 40 years old. He's up and walking, picked up his bed. He's walking. 
and uh, people, thousands of people are, are coming to believe because of their work. They, the, 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 the chief priests and the chief priest's family and all the elders, they get together and they bring them on in. And they say, they listen to them and they, say, they listen to how they're talking about the scripture. And they say, now, we know that these are common and uneducated people. You know, they, 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 they are fishermen. They, they, they don't know enough to be talking like they're talking. They don't know enough to have the power that they have. They, they don't come from the right background. Am I telling your story? Can you relate to what it means to be underestimated, to be judged as unworthy, to be counted out and discounted? I'm talking about good trouble. The way, the way that we see their story, it emphasizes God's power. It emphasizes God's ability to use the ordinary. And it's a contrast to the religious leaders. And what I'm hoping is that we, as a community of believers here at Pilgrim, when we understand leadership and what it means to have the courage to be in good trouble, that we'll understand what, what Martin Luther and what, what the scriptures talk about in the priesthood of all believers. That means that the deacon, the member, the pastor, the worship leader, the musicians, Everybody has the exact same value before God. Radically flat, radically egalitarian. This is the type of stuff that they were implementing in their community in Jerusalem in the presence of their enemies. All right, now we're ready to get to the three points and we'll be done. Courage to pray, courage to witness, and courage to stand. We'll be done. All right, last week we did courage to worship, courage to work, courage to wait. Today we're going to do courage to pray, courage to witness, and courage to stand. And we'll be done. Courage to pray. Now look, uh, it takes courage to have some good friends. Watch this. They come back. They've been through all that we just talked about. All that we just talked about. They've been... Uh, lock, locked up, put, you know, they've been talked to, they've been put down, they've been threatened, they've been, uh, uh, and, and, and they come back and they tell their friends all the abuse that they went through. They talk about all the humiliation. They talk about all the rejection. They talk to their friends. Uh-oh. Is there somebody here who knows what it means to have good friends? to be able to expose your true self, to have the courage to talk about your disappointments, to have the courage about all the times that you did the right thing and people treated you bad anyway, all the times that you helped in Jesus' name somebody else to be blessed and they forgot about it, all the times that you did good trouble, necessary trouble, and you got hurt you got disappointed. You got rejected. All right. It takes courage to have good friends. It takes courage to talk about what you've been through. Because we show up here on Sunday morning, and uh, everybody except Emily knows how messed up I am. I mean, every, every, nobody except Emily knows. Now, maybe that might be true. Maybe I just said something. <laughs> maybe I'm the fool. But but I don't think anybody knows, like, I know nobody knows like Emily knows how messed up I am. How about that? And so, uh, but it takes courage to have good friends. Because when you have good friends, the closer the relationship gets over time, the more that it grows in God's grace, the more about you and your story gets revealed. So they told them the story. And you know what they did in response? They prayed in community. It takes courage to pray in community. Now, they, they heard the story. They heard about the rejection. They heard about all the resentment. They heard about all, uh, all the jealousy and, 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 and all the things that the disciples went through, all the things that, that, that they had to endure, and they went into prayer. Some of your friends don't need your opinion right away. 
So, some of your friends don't need to know what you read in the last self-help book that you opened up halfway. Some of your friends need to know that you can pray with them in community. It takes courage to pray. It takes courage to pray the kind of prayer that they prayed. Look at the prayer they prayed. They prayed that, well, we'll get to that. They prayed a prayer that was phenomenal in the way that they understood how powerful God was. For they said in their prayer here, first of all, it, it's miraculous to me. It says here in verse 24, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, and then it's almost like they all prayed this together. Sovereign Lord. Now, I don't have an answer to that. Some Bible scholars, you all might have to help me out with that. But, but according to the, to the flow of the text, they miraculously... Now, now, I will say, uh, if you look later on, it says in verse 31 that they were of one heart and soul. So, so we're talking about a group of people in community in a heightened sense of God's presence operating in them in power and demonstration. But look at this. So, so, so they prayed, and according to, they, they prayed this all together. Sovereign Lord. They start to praise God. They start to look and, and, and recognize the legacy of, uh, of, of what God had predicted about the anointed one. But then what I want you all to look here is it takes courage to pray in the midst of your enemies. It says, look, you anointed, and then they, ref, they call them by name. If you're going to be praying and praying this type of courageous prayer for good trouble, call the name. What are we, what are we going against? Paul said we're not against powers and princes, you know, against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities in high places. Call the name white supremacy. <laughs> Sexism. Racism, ageism, all right, <laughs> but they, they didn't have those. They said Herod, all right, how many of y'all know about Herod? I, mean, I, I got to hurry up here. Uh, Her Herod, th that's the name of somebody who came from your same cultural, you know, if, if we were looking at the uh, black history, this would be the overseer on the plantation. The, 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 uh, the Herodian family had negotiated a, a contract with Rome that allowed them to set themselves up and set up a priesthood, set up a rulership over all of Judea, all the, that Palestinian area. And, 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 and all, because of the reputation the Jews had, they had a carve-out in Roman law. We don't have time to get into all that. But the, the point was, there, the deal with Rome was, Herod, you can run this whole place just make sure the Jews don't cause any more problems. <laughs> Just make sure they stay quiet and docile. They stay over there in Palestine and Judea, and they don't cause any more problems. We don't want to have to send our military back over there. So you can run the whole place. You, you don't even have to say that the Roman emperor is your God. Everybody else did. Y'all just keep those people in check. All right, KRS-One would have said, officer, officer, overseer. <laughs> All right, so, so that's Herod. But then Pontius Pilate. And this is somebody else who's trying to keep everybody docile and keep everybody in their line, keep everybody from disrupting anything. But this person is, was outside of their culture. He was part of the actual Roman Empire. And his whole idea was, how do I keep these people from being disruptive? All right, and so here we have the disciples. And, and they are messing up the whole idea of not being, they are being peaceful, but they're being disruptive. They're doing things for that, that, that they're healing in Jesus' name, and they are changing society. They're changing the way they treat each other. Jesus said himself, by what? By love, by the love that you show one to another where people know that you're my disciples. The Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. I want to part parenthetically here. The peoples of Israel, that, that's the real religious types, the ones who uh, I believe are earnest, but they're trying to hold the tradition so much that they miss the master. They're trying to hold on to the way things used to be done so much 
that they lift up man-made customs and lift them up as if there's something that are uh, approved and authorized by the Bible and Jesus Christ. So, so they pray a prayer, but, but this is where I'm trying to get to. The prayer says that all these enemies, in verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Watch this. Rewind. Wait a minute. God's plan includes my rejection? Wait a minute. What? Rewind. God's predestined that people are going to hate me? What? Somebody should have told me that before I signed up for this Christian thing. Somebody should have given me the whole plan. Some of you, if you'd known the plan, you wouldn't have signed up for this thing. But our goal in this world is to be disruptive. We are supposed to be on the side of the poor, the rejected, those who are disenfranchised, those who are left out, those who are, those who are, are, are counted out, those who call on the name of God, and yet the world decides that they're not worthy to walk with God. So brothers and sisters, our job as Christians is to do what it is that God has called. We've got to have courage to pray, but we've got to have courage to witness. You see, too many of us have taken the good news and we keep it and, 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 it, and it keeps us, but we keep it to ourselves. Too, too many of us have come a long way with Jesus, and, 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 and we know what God has done in our life. We know the, 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 the blessings that God has bestowed on us in spite of us. We know all about the miracles that God has done in our family, with our friends, but we keep it to ourselves. Too many of us, my brothers and sisters, we've been through so much mess. God has done so much in our lives and through us, but we keep it to ourselves. We've got to have the courage to witness. But then, my brothers and sisters, we've got to have the courage to stand. You see, they pray this prayer. They, they have one heart and, 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 and one thing. We don't have time to get into it now, but they have, uh, uh, the, we get into it right after this, we find out that they have everything in common. Uh, if, they might not have been communists, but they were communitarian. They, they, we get the story of Barnabas selling his lands and, and putting all that money into the community, <laughs> sacrificial giving so that uh, everybody had enough. All right, that's, that's, we're pushing the envelope there. We're not ready for that yet. But, but I do want to focus on the fact that they were full of the Holy Spirit to the point where they were of one heart, one mind, one soul. You can do that type of stuff. You can have power as a community of Christians when you have that type of power. And so let's get to this last point, courage to stand. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken. Some of y'all don't know how powerful that is. The place where they stand was shaken. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to close this, but I remember uh, we had an earthquake in D.C. some years ago. I forget the year. I remember standing in my office, and we heard a big thump, 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 thump. Everybody came out to the hallway, started looking around. What happened? What happened? Uh, the earth was shook, and, the, and we were shaken. Our emotions were shaken. Our mental state was shaken. We didn't know to, to run. or Our fight and flight stuff all kicked in. We, we were like, it, it, was, it was terrible. Now, Haggai chapter 2, uh, verse 6, and I think Haggai chapter 2, verse 21, uh, the prophet talks about how God is going to speak and shake the heavens and shake the earth. And then he talks to the governor and he, and he says, uh, I'm going to speak again and I'm going to shake the earth. I'm going to shake the heavens. And the, and the author of Hebrews picks this theme up and he says, look, the reason he's talking about shaking again is because God in Christ has shaken up things, 
But watch this. The kingdom of God cannot be shaken. Oh, no, you missed it. That's your shout right there. The kingdom of God cannot be shaken. There, there's some things in your life that can't be shaken. The earth can shake. The heavens can shake. Your body can shake. Your mental state can shake. But the kingdom of God can... Oh, oh I, I know. The, somebody ought to shout. There's some things in your life that God has put in you through Christ Jesus that cannot be shaken. I don't care what's shaking all around you. I don't care what storms are blowing. There's some stuff that God has put in you like love can't be shaken. Your faith can't be shaken. Your trust in God can't be shaken. Everything can shake all around you, but I'm so glad that some stuff can't be shaken. Shake on, world. But the kingdom of God won't shake. All right. I'm trying to finish it. But then it says, and they, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Courage to stand. You got to stand while it's shaking. But then uh, uh, the, the courage to stand means you're standing still. The, the, in fact, the custom of the day wasn't to kneel. It, the, the, the position of prayer was standing. In the synagogue, you stood to prayer. So here they are praying and standing in one place standing together on one accord. Uh, my kids aren't in here, but uh, they, 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 they're always trying to say, I can do it myself, I can do it myself, I can do it myself. Our five-year-old, uh, Olivia, uh, she's now um, thinking that she's an expert at pouring uh, orange juice or milk <laughs> into her little plastic cups. And every time I just start, because I know who we're going to have to clean up a mess if the cup moves. Watch this. So she picks it up, and she's so confident. She's so calm, cool, collect. And, and she, she has made a mess in the past. But she's got her little self together now, where she holds the cup with one hand. <laughs> and she'll get that juice in the other hand. And the cup stays in one place, and the cup gets filled up. Watch this. Don't move. Don't move. The earth may be shaking, but you stay in one place and watch God fill you up. Watch God fill you up with peace that the world. Watch God fill you up with joy that the world can't take away. Peace that passes all understanding. Watch God fill you up with confidence to trust in the Lord. All right. I'm, last thing, last thing, and I'm going to let you go. You got to have courage to stand. Stand while it's shaking. Stand while you're being filled. But watch this. It says, and then they went on and they kept on speaking. Speaking the word of God with boldness. They kept on speaking the word of God with boldness. First of all, that means they had something to say. That means they had learned about God. They, they had seen some. They had, and, 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 and I love that they said speaking the word of God. You see, in the New Testament, there's at least two kinds of faith. There, there, there's a faith based on things you see. And then Jesus said, but greater are those who are going to believe they haven't seen a thing they just heard about it oh, oh i know i know i know the the faith that comes by all right we we won't hear him by the oh bless you and the word of god by and how can they preach unless they've been sent all right so so look th this is important god has made it such that there's more than one preacher in this building, and there's more than just me and Jason Jones. God has made it such that each and every one of us is a conduit for the testimony of Jesus Christ to creep out into this world so that we can disrupt wherever we are with good news about the kingdom that's filled with peace and justice and egalitarianism and, and respect and honor for one another, but it won't shake. You got to stay in one place to get filled. But then it says with boldness. Now, that, now this, this, this boldness idea is an idea, and that's really how we stitch this in with courage. In fact, scholars, when they look at this, we talked about Hezekiah praying last week in Jerusalem. They, they look at the logic of this prayer, and, and the scholars line it up like, like Hezekiah prayed with the enemies outside, and, and these folks prayed the same type of prayer 
But they didn't pray for deliverance from their enemies. Oh. They prayed for boldness to face their enemy. Oh. Boldness to go out and speak the word of God, trusting that if the word of God is on your lips, that God will deliver people, heal people, change people. God will make a way where there is no... Okay, all right. But look at this concept of the boldness. This concept of boldness, there's a couple of layers of this thing of boldness. And this morning we had J- co-pastor Jason Jones, he, he came in the hallway and, and, and I heard him out there and he, and he knocked on the door. Now, now, what y'all don't know, but I know, is Jason has a combination to the lock to the pastor's office. So I said, come on in.